gentlemen, before I go into the enactment, first of all, I want to say thank God for this opportunity. Uh, I don't take portraying Frederick Douglass, I don't take that lightly. The question was, uh, Mr. Dowridge, how did you start doing Frederick Douglass? And, and I'm just going to keep it real with you. One morning, I was up brushing my teeth, and I heard three times, Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass. And at the time I was married, so I looked around to see was my wife in the room. No one was in the room but me, and I'm like, wait a minute, this is freaky. So believe it or not, once I got myself together, I went down to the Strauss Theater in Tampa, and I reserved the Tico Theater. My first audience was only 50 people. And I stood there with a podium, and I read word for word about Frederick Douglass to the audience. I was shy, I was, I was nervous, you know, and out of place. But you know what's so wonderful, and somebody told me maybe five years later, they said, the reason you are so successful for this is because of the fact that when God spoke to you, you went straight into action. You know, sometimes, you know, I hear this a lot. Uh, it's like, yeah, well, you know, God told me to do this, and I'm like, really, God? You want me to do this? But when he came at me, I just jumped on it. There wasn't no question about it, you know. And since then, I just want to, I just, this is my um, ninth year as Frederick Douglass. God has taken me from Tampa, Florida to Detroit, Michigan, just about all over America portraying Frederick Douglass. And I know there's other brothers out there that are portraying Frederick as well. But just a mere fact, because of, and I want somebody to take a message out of it, because I jumped into it, I didn't question it, God is taking care of the rest. So, what I like to do, I know I have only a few minutes, I want to bring Frederick Douglass to the fold. It is an honor to be here today. In case you don't know, February the 14th, which is arriving very shortly, will be my 200th birthday. So forgive me if I'm walking kind of old, and forgive me if you see the dust come off of me. But I would like to let you know that I stole these hands, I stole these feet to run from slavery. As I stated earlier, I was born February the 14th, 1818, on a plantation in Western Maryland. On that plantation, Massa had 500 slaves, and it was one of the richest, sla richest plantations there was. Now, my mother, Miss Bailey, forgive me, Betty Bailey, she was a slave, as you suspect. My grandmother, which I still can't get over to this day, who took care of my master and my master's family, was treated in such a harsh manner. So much so that when she came, began to get up in age, they took my grandmother out into the wilderness and put her in a cabin by herself. Now, I will say this, that I had a love for my grandmother, meaning so that my grandmother and I, we would go on walks and we would have talks, and this one particular day, my grandmother took me out to a friend's house, and there I had the opportunity to meet my brothers and sisters. My grandmother said, Frederick, go play with them. I said no, because I was so attached to my grandmother. Well. She took me and left me in the room because I didn't want to play with the kids. But when I came out, I found out something. When one of my brothers came to me and said, Frederick, Grandma's gone. And I said, gone? And believe it or not, from that day, I never saw my grandmother again. And it hurted me that long after she had passed, come to find out. She had, you know, she had passed without my knowledge. And at that time, when she passed, it was like, if you will, like that wall there. I had no feelings. When my mother passed, who would? Maybe three times a week, 
12 miles. Can you imagine, especially for the ladies here, can you imagine? Put yourself in my mother's shoes. 12 miles. Now I'm looking down and I see some very nice shoes here. 12 miles in the wilderness with no shoes. Running. 12 miles. And then on top of that, had to be back on the plantation the next morning. If not, she would get a whipping. But 12 miles she would come three times a week to see her little Valentine. Who's a little Valentine? Frederick, Washington, Augustus, Bailey, me. And she would rock me in her arms and she would sing songs to me. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she would disappear. My mother. Well, as the story goes, people would ask me, well, who's your daddy? Who's your father? Well, I tell you what, my father was a white man, Aaron Anthony. And I'm yet to see a black man with a sailor's hat rolling in a, in a boat on the, on the Chesapeake. It didn't happen because all the black men were slaves. My father, Aaron Anthony, and I'll let you know that Aaron Anthony, who I disowned, because what did he do? He raped my mother. And when I would get in trouble, Massa would whip me as well. Well, Massa had a daughter, Lucretia R. She was married to Hugh R. So Lucretia, what she did, and I gotta let you know this, she didn't know that I was her little brother. Well, I got shipped to a place called Baltimore. Anybody ever heard of a place called Baltimore, Maryland? I got shipped to Baltimore. And when I got shipped to Baltimore, I got shipped there because I was going to be the caretaker of little Tommy. Little Tommy is Mr. and Mrs. Art's child. Now, Miss Sophia, who was the wife of Master Art, she took a liking to me. So I let you know, when I got to Baltimore, and I got off that cart, and I walked towards the door, they were standing there at the door to greet me. But here's the thing, Miss Art, she was standing there with those big rosy cheeks and them big wide teeth and the stars in her eyes looking at me. Now, you must understand, unlike today, you folks look white people in the eyes. We were not allowed to do that. So as I got closer, quite naturally, I dropped my head. But then when I got closer, Miss Art, Miss Sophia, she said, Frederick, look at me. And I'm thinking to myself, if I look at that white woman, they're going to kill me. So I kept my head down, and the closer I got, I could see her feet. She took her hand, put it underneath my cheek, and raised my cheek up. As I came up, I came up just like this. And she said, Frederick, you open your eyes. I was scared. Open your eyes, Frederick. And when I opened up my eyes, I saw those blue eyes looking me dead in my eyes, those rosy cheeks, and that big smile. Frederick, this is your home. Would you believe Miss Sophia went on to treat me not as a slave, but as a human being? You might as well say I was her black son. Now, Miss Sophia, she had issues in reading. So when Master Ard would go on about his business, Miss Sophia would be in the kitchen or in the living room with a book. Sometimes that book would be a magazine. Sometimes that book would be a Bible. Sometimes that book would just be a law. And because she had issues reading, she would invite me. Yeah. She would invite me over to help read. And I would come over there and go to sit on the floor. And she said, no, Frederick, you come sit on the couch with me. And I'll cuddle all up with her while she got the book. And one day, we were doing ABCs. A, B, C. And all of a sudden, here come Master coming through the door. And he saw that. And he said, Sophia, don't you be teaching them. And I'm just going to say the word. Don't you be teaching those niggas how to read. You teach them how to read, they don't want to take over. We'll become the slaves. Don't do that. So quite naturally, I'm shaking, I'm scared, because I'm thinking I'm getting ready to get a what? A lashing. Well, as he came close, he stood in front of me. And he said, Frederick, now, now son, I want you to hear this. He said, Frederick, don't you never catch me catch you read. You understand that? 
me down with my head down. I said, Master, I never read. Master, I hate reading. Reading's no good, Master. I never gonna read again. Well, I'll let you know. That's what my mouth said. But in my mind, my mind said, we're going to read some more. We're going to read some more. So what happened is, as I began, as I was there to take care of little, little uh, Tommy, they didn't know this. Tommy would come home with his books, go upstairs to his, to his room. And when they would go off to do whatever they were doing, I would sneak up to the room. I would get those books, and I would open those books up, young king, and I would start reading. Because I wanted to learn how to what? Read. read. Well, one day Master came home and said, Frederick, where are you? So they knew I was upstairs, so I hurried up and closed the book, and I ran downstairs, and I said, I see here, Master. You up there reading? No, Master, I was not reading. Well, just to move on, Master found out that I was an intelligent little Negro because I had read. So what happened is, in case you don't know this, ladies and gentlemen, what goes in here, goes in here, comes out here. So instead of me talking such as, yes, Master, I don't know what, what it's going to be like, I was talking like this. Well, I've been reincarnated, and I'm moving to the north one day. They said, no, that nigga too smart. We, gonna, we got something for him. So they sent me to Master Corvette. Now about this time, I'm about 16 years old, I'm plump, I'm big. So they sent me to Master Corvette. The first day I got there, Master beat me. Master beat me six months in a row every day. If you think Coop the had marks on him, I got marks. Well, one day, we was out fanning the mill. And I got sick, I had a pain right here. Master came and he said, Frederick, what's wrong? I said, Master, I'm painting right here. He said, well, let me see. So I moved my hand, and he kicked me in my side. I ran. I ran seven miles back to Master Art's house. When I got there, I said, Master, Master, please help me, because Master's trying to kill me. Master Art said, son, if you don't, he said, Frederick, if you don't go back, I'm going to kill you. To this day, I love Miss Sophia, because Miss Sophia said, let him stay. And I got blood gushing, gushing on me. She said, let him stay tonight. So she cleaned me up. I cleaned me up. I slept in the bed. The next morning I came downstairs. They were having breakfast. As I'm coming down the stairwell, I can smell it. My stomach is growling. And all of a sudden, I wanted to sit at the table. All they did was the door. So I went back. And as I got back to the plantation, ladies and gentlemen, I took this lady going over the fence. Who was coming? Master Corvée, what did he have in his hand? He had a whip in his hand. And as he came, son, I took my leg from off of that fence and I ran back. Well, while I was in the midst of the woods, I met a free black slave. He took me in, fed me, and he took me out to the woods the next day. And he said, Frederick, he dug. And he came up with a rabbit's foot. He said, Frederick, if you put this rabbit foot in your pocket, I guarantee you, that man won't whip you no more. So I took that rabbit foot and I put it in my pocket and I went back. And guess what? As I was going over the fence, who's coming again? Master. But this time, Master Corvette, he comes and he says, Frederick, how are you? Welcome back. And I'm like, oh, this rabbit foot works. So he took me in. And he said, Frederick, tomorrow morning, this is what I want you to do. I want you to clean out the barn. So I'm in there cleaning out the barn and he comes in. What does he have in his hand? He has a whip. So me, as he came up to me, he snapped the whip and it tied around my ankle. And I leaned down and I wrapped it around my arm. And I pulled it towards me. And that began the two-hour fight that him and I had. When the two hours was up, who got up and who stayed down? I got up, Master stayed down. Master didn't go out and blast to the world that, yeah, that slave beat me. You know why he didn't do it? Because he was supposed to be the slave breaker. I stayed there on that plantation for another six months. I was free in my mind, but in fact, I was still a slave. And Master would come to me and he said, don't have me get at you, Frederick. In my mind, I would say, you don't want no more of this. <laughs> so after that, I got moved again 
I got with the uh, Master Freeman's uh, uh, plantation just to move along. Master Freeman, he was a he was a laid back master. So what I would used to do, like each one of you all, we would have classes out in the woods, and I would teach slaves from that young man's age, this young man's age, all the way up to a hundred, how to read. Well, somebody say Judas. We had Judas in the midst. Judas went out and told Massa what was going on. And, and all those masters came in with chains and whips. And they began to whip us. And we, had, we could not have any more classes. So you know what I started doing? Because I'm the smartest one, right? I started writing our classes. We had planned an escape. Well, again, Judas went back and told on us. So that killed the escape. The escape. Everybody say September the 18th, 1838. That was the day that this beautiful young lady who was free, and she became my wife, Anna Murray. Her and I, we met, and she sold some of her items, allowing me to get on that train and go north and become free. Well, I landed in New York. When I landed in New York, I met this lawyer who took me in. When he took me in, I rested. The next day I woke up, ladies and gentlemen, guess who was sitting down in the living room? Who? My future wife was sitting down in the living room. And that lawyer, he married us. We became Mr. and Mrs. Bailey. Now here's the trick though. I changed my last name from Bailey. They gave me the name of Johnson. I said, no, I don't want that name because of the fact that there were so many Johnsons. And as I traveled around the country, right away, they would recognize me as a slave. So, the Lady of the Lake well, was a play. They gave me that name. Because there was a person in that play with Douglas. One S. I got two S. Douglas. And that's how Frederick Douglas, my name Frederick Douglas, was born. So as I went north, I wound up meeting a gentleman by the name of William Lord Garrison. Am I telling the story right? Yeah. William Lord Garrison. I was minding my business at a, at a meeting. And Mr. Garrison walked up to me and he said, Frederick Douglass. And I'm like, yes. He said, I heard about you. As a matter of fact, I wrote about you. And I was like, wow. So he had me to come up and speak. And at this time, I was 23 years old. And I got up, I was nervous, but I was telling all these white folks about what was going on down south with the slaves. Would you know when I got finished, an hour and a half later, all those white folks got up and gave me a standing ovation. William Lord Garrison hired me as one of his speakers, and we went on a six-month speaking tour. Well, 1845 was my first book. Matter of fact, I believe this young man right here came up and showed you the book. The Narrative of Life of Frederick Douglass. And all those white people refused to believe that I, a black man wrote that book, even though the foreword was written by no other than Mr. Garrison. Well, just to move on, 1845, my book come out, all of a sudden William Lord Garrison, he busts in the house and he said, Frederick, Frederick, you got to go. I got five children. I got my wife Anna. Frederick, Frederick, you done told on your master. You got to go. And I'm like, but William, I can't leave. This is my family. And my beautiful wife, Anna. Just like my sister here with the little girl in her lap, she had my little Annie in her lap. This is what she said, Frederick, go, go, we'll take care of it. Well, I have you know, I left and I went to Canada. And I went forward to New England. And when I got over to England, are you ready for this? I met up with some wonderful people over there and they wound up taking $750. And they sent it to my master, Huard, right here in America, for my freedom. And when I came back to America, at 27 years old, I came back as a free man. They wanted me to stay over and just live the luxury life. I said, no, I must come back to America, because that's where my people are going through a hard time. So I gave up my freedom to come back to fight for my people. 1862, October, I'm going to wrap up, 1862, I had the opportunity as the first black man. Now, a lot of you all relate to President Barack Obama. A lot of you all relate to Martin Luther King, Jr. But the real story is, 
I was the first black man to go to the White House. Yes. I was the first black man to be invited to the Oval Office. I was the first black man that had the opportunity to sit there as a man and speak with President Abraham Lincoln. And not only was I the first black man, but the true story is President Abraham Lincoln and I were really close friends. Can you imagine back then a black man going to the White House and the guards are like, no, no, you must go to the back. And have president, the president walk by and look, that sounds like my friend Frederick. Yes. Let him in. So I have, you know, I had on a black suit and a white shirt and my tie. I felt like Superman because my chest expanded so wide. And when I walked in there, those guards, and when I walked up to the president, not, we didn't just shake, we hugged each other. And that was a wonderful time. So anyway, we gathered in the Oval Office. And we talked about the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment. About black people, yes, being free in this country, but not only that, black men having the opportunity to serve in the Civil War. Black women having the opportunity to vote. Those are the subject matters we talked about. And I'll never forget 200 years later, the president got up and he said, well, Frederick, you know we're dear friends, but I think that we should wait or the freedom. President Abraham Lincoln, in case you don't notice, he had slaves. But he also wanted slavery to end, but he was hesitant. He said, well, wait a minute, how about we wait till I'll sign the order, and we'll wait till the year 1900. So ladies and gentlemen, what that means is that 1963, when Martin Luther King spoke in Washington, D.C., that would have been the real freedom day for blacks in this country. But I coerced that president to sign what is known as the Emancipation Proclamation. That's right. And we waited, even though I was in Rochester, New York that night, we waited for the sun to come up. And when that sun come up and the word traveled all the way to Rochester, New York from Washington, D.C., that we are officially free people. January 1, 1863. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the... The, the Freedom March, that was a celebration of all times. And I'll let you know, from 1863 to 2018, we as a black people, we must continue to strive. We cannot sit on our laws. As I look out, I see nice cars. I see nice clothes on our bodies. I see some of us with nice jobs, making nice money. We cannot forget Ladies and gentlemen, that we are still in the struggle. Yes. Yes. And what's that? I say, especially to the young folks here, continue to read. Continue to go and get that education. Continue to be the best that you can be each and every day that God give you breath. Because one day, it is projected that you will be our leaders. But you won't be our leaders if you don't educate so with that, I say this, educate, educate, educate. Thank you very much.